who's now the, 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 we're struggling particularly and um, through the pandemic in terms of, of, of fundraising and there is an awful lot of information that is out there and available for you we are just one of those sources of information for you but we had this this uh, idea so we created this fundraising hub and we ran a series of webinars which i shall talk about a bit later um, um, and it culminated in putting this box together so that every church had had a resource that they could use that would help guide them through. Next slide, please, Liz. So the, 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 the purpose of the box is to be a step by step guide to help you navigate through um, through the complex world of, of church fundraising. Um, that it contains four booklets, um, which we'll go through one by one, um, that it, the purpose is to make your fundraising journey um, easier and more successful. And it includes things that, that will be familiar for people who have been fundraising for, for many years, but also lots of stuff for people who've never done fundraising before to try and help you as to where you need to go. Next slide, please, Liz. Uh, I can't see it's coming up, so um, <laughs> um, I don't know where the next slide is. Um, yep, yeah, excellent. Um, so if you've opened your box, you should have four booklets in it um, with numbers one, two, three and four on. You should have an orange booklet, which is the first one that we'll look at. Um, a poster to, for thanking people for their support and a research template for um, recording all the research that you do for the uh, for individual donors. Next slide, please, Liz. So the orange book booklet, um, I don't know if you've actually got the book, the box in front of you, but if you look in the orange booklet, next slide, Liz. Um, it, it contains a quick guide um, in the open front two pages um, that, that detail the rest of the contents um, and it gives you the um, a, a quick find for fundraising needs and where you need to look for them. So if you're looking for um, how to um, get people to help with fundraising, then you need to go to booklet one and section 1.2. It's that simple. We've tried to keep it really easy and clear for you. Um, um, so whether you're new to fundraising or have some experience, you can quickly and easily find the things that you that you need to um, need to look for. Next slide, please, Liz. One of the things that it contains is some key fundraising terms that you can understand what the guys are referencing um, and also a checklist to help identify the things that you need to consider with any fundraising project. And fundraising in this context includes your regular and planned giving, as well as, as fundraising for specific projects or needs. I think one of the key things to remember in this is that you can't eat an elephant in one sitting. Um, it needs to be broken down into bite-sized pieces. So when you're thinking about your parish's fundraising needs, it can often feel like a really enormous task, whether it's for a major project or just to keep um, going, um, as so many of us are at the moment. So it's really important to, to keep motivation by breaking it down into small steps so that you're not trying to tackle the whole thing at once. And the box of resources breaks the four key areas for fundraising, which are planning, finding donors, making the ask and saying thank you um, down into those manageable, manageable chunks to help you. Next slide, please, please. And I'm just going to hand over to, to Heather for this one. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today, albeit remotely, but it, um, it has meant I haven't had a long drive from, from West Yorkshire. Um, as Liz said, I'm the church insurance consultant. I stepped into Kay's very large shoes. Um, and from the feedback I've had so far from churches, it suggests that you're going to be very well supported down, down in the southwest. Um, so looking at the, uh, the planning, which is a really important sort of fundamental part of the beginning of your fundraising campaign. So it's worth spending time get, getting this part right and doing the proprietary work. Liz, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So um, there's three elements to planning that you really need to think about. The fundraising vision, the fundraising team, um, and the fundraising plan. And the fundraising vision, as it said there, it really should inspire. Um, it's about demonstrating what the shared goals are and what the aims and objective of your fundraising campaign is about. It's about providing a clear um, and consistent message and showing what that um, shared goal is. It doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, succinct, um, fundraising visions are often more, more helpful. And what it should do, it should enable anyone who's involved in the campaign and the wider church community to be able to articulate what that fundraising campaign is all about and give a real clear message to donors and funders what, what you're wanting to achieve. The fundraising team, it's very much about finding the right people. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be uh, people who have got a lot of expertise um, in fundraising. What, it re what you really need in your fundraising team is people who've got that stamina and commitment and really knowing what they're letting themselves in for. And when you're looking for volunteers, being really clear and honest about what the commitment is that, that you need. There may well be people uh, within the congregation, within the PCC, that have particular skills, maybe hidden talents. Um, and in the booklet, the, the book one, um, there's a skills audit template, um, and that will help you um, ask the questions and find out what, what talents there may be already within your congregation. Um, it's an opportunity to get other people involved. Um, and I think COVID in itself may bring new opportunities to bring new people in. As we've seen COVID, the pandemic has unfortunately meant a lot of people have lost their jobs. People have changed their priorities, their circumstances have changed. And there may be people who want to become volunteers for your church and who are able to bring different skills or able to learn new skills themselves really important that it's, that it's a fundraising team um, so it's not left to one or two individuals to carry the whole burden but it's important that it's driven maybe by one or two people who who drive the project forward um, and maintain that momentum there's a question over about whether to employ a professional fundraiser i.e. somebody who will fundraise on your behalf but for a fee and there's pros and cons to that and the Charities Commission have got lots of information uh, to help trustees, help PCCs think about whether it's, it's right for them or not. The other important thing within the fundraising team is to celebrate success because there will be peaks and troughs and there'll be times when you want to crack open that bottle of champagne and there'll be times when you want to kick metaphorically kick the cat um, but but build on build on that success because that helps build the track record for future applications as well and it will sustain you um, through the knockbacks that you'll inevitably have believe it or not being part of a fundraising team and running events can be fun and we know through this whole pandemic um, one of the issues we've had, we've all been very isolated from each other. And so fundraising events can bring people together, even if it's only remotely. And as we know, that's needed more than ever now. Fundraising plan or the fundraising strategy, simply put, it's the funds that you require and the tasks that need to be undertaken in order for you to develop, um, to, to deliver your plan. It involves donate, uh, donor research, which Kay will go on to talk about in a little bit more detail later on. But again, there's a template in book one to help you think about your um, fundraising plan and what you need to put in it. It should hold key, um, key information um, and it's a working document basically to keep track um, of your plan. And it can be really helpful to demonstrate to funders that you've got a fundraising plan because it shows that you, you've got good governance um, and you're approaching this in, in an organised way. And remember, before 
um, you apply for grants, you'll need to know what the project costs are and make sure those project costs are accurate. Because if you get them wrong, you're unlikely to be able to go back uh, to a funder to, to get more uh, to get more money. Um, and some funders will put a cap on the level of professional fees that can be included. So those are things that, that you need to think about. Um, running alongside um, the fundraising plan is, is the project plan. Um, and the purpose of the project plan is to identify milestones. What are the milestones within your project that you need to consider? And again, there's a template to help you think about what the milestones will be for your particular project. And again, that's in booklet one. The BDI amongst you will notice that our um, project plan talks about planning rather than faculty. Now, for most cases, we'll be looking at faculty for the projects that we're looking at, but statutory planning might be required and your architect or your DAC will be able to um, help and advise on that. Now, put together, the project plan and the fundraising plan will help you with cash flow. Those two documents together, you'll know when cash is coming in and when you're likely to need to start spending money. So they're really good, useful documents. Um, and all of these points that I've talked about now will instill confidence in funders and donors that your church is worth supporting financially. Um, they'll know what difference their funds will make and it should enthuse them to want to get involved and make the difference. Back over to you, Kay. Thank you. Take myself off mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the second booklet in, in your box is the blue one, um, Finding Donors. <clears throat> if you could move on to the next slide, please, Liz. And identifying potential donors is going to be key to success, whether that is for your um, for a major project or, or for general funds. Um, you need to find people who are willing to give you money. Um, there's a template included in, in, in the box. It's the blue one, this, this one here, um, which inside has a nice template on it that you can, you can use and you can um, um, photocopy it as, as often as you as you need um, but there's also some fictitious examples in the booklet to help get you thinking about the the, the different types and 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 places that you can go where are you going to find potential donors um, there's a list of, of sources on our fundraising hub, which I'll, I'll talk about again um, um, towards the end. And, and that's very helpful to start your research. Um, there's also um, a, a lots and lots of um, uh, online databases, um, some of which do require a subscription, um, but for, for helping to find, uh, find grants. And there are websites that are dedicated to church funding, um, such as church grants, parish resourcing, and the Charities um, Aid Foundation. Um, and of course, there is All, all Churches Trust. Um, but one, one of the really brilliant pieces of, of where to look for funding that you have in, in, in Cornwall um, is the list of, of funding that is, um, list of sources of funding uh, on the Transformation Cornwall website. Um, and they publish a list of funding sources that's updated weekly um, and it's especially useful for faith-based social action projects um, that I've put a link at the end um, to, to their website um, but it's it, that's a really really key um, place to go and, and in fact it's so key we have it on our fundraising hub as well as, as somewhere to go for, um, for, for information as to where you can find um, find donors and in this context we're talking about the the wider donors um, the, the the grant making bodies um, funders want you to apply to them. It's the reason that they exist. Um, that's what they're there for. They are there to give money away. Um, so their websites often also contain a wealth of useful information to help you in your application because they, they want the things to be right when they receive them too. Um, so as I say, there are lots and lots of sources of information um, for you. Um, and um, the, the booklet gives you some of those where you can actually go and look. The type of donor and their area of interest is important here. There's no point asking um, people or organisations who specialise in bells to donate for organ repairs, for example. 
um, and not all grant making organisations uh, support religious activities. So how you frame your project is very important as well. You need to research the potential funders in detail to make sure you're approaching the right ones for your project. And think about too, is it exclusively for the congregation's benefit? Um, so for example, do you want something that is just for live streaming your services to your congregation on a Sunday? Or is it something that could end up for community benefits? So could, um, could you actually become a community hub with, um, with computer resources and, and, and Wi-Fi resources that the whole community could use? Because funders are much more likely to support that sort of project that's more community focused than, than, than ones that are specifically just for the church's benefit. As you research your donors, keep your vision firmly in mind, that vision that, that Heather referred to, but don't be afraid to expand it or update it um, as, uh, or update your plan as you find out information that could be of benefit later, because it might be that you're researching something and, and they're not suitable for what you're looking at right now, but actually they could be useful later. Um, so, so make sure that when you're researching your donors, you're, you're thinking wider than, than just the immediate picture so that you can, um, you can keep the, the details handy on your template of research so that you can, um, you can come back to them later. And as well as grant making bodies, your local community is also a source of funding. Um, so um, ways to um, think about reaching out and who you need to reach out to. Think about those who, who have um, an interest in whatever your project is covering. <clears throat> so if it's, if it's something to do with youth, um, could, could the schools be involved? Um, are there other bodies uh, around um, uniformed organisations that, that, that could have an impact and an interest in, in, in what you're doing? Think about the people that might benefit from it. And are there those groups of people that you could draw in as well? And community here can include not just the people that live locally, but those that have a connection with the church uh, in, in some way through being married there or grandparents or whatever. Um, those who love church buildings, um, there are an awful lot of church crawlers uh, around and, and there are some of them on this screen <laughs> um, and, um, and they might want to support specific types of projects um, such as youth or, or older folk um, and so on. Um, you might have walking groups or, or local schools or civic groups that, that can help, not just ne necessarily financially, but they also might be able to provide practical support um, uh, to you as well. So don't forget those, those, those people in the wider community. I think one of the, the main things is that communication is, is key to whatever you're doing. Um, um, and in the same way that you need a clear vision and plan for um, for grant making bodies, the same also applies to individuals and, and, and groups. Why are you fundraising? How might they be able to help? What difference will their support make? Engage them with your story and have a clear message. And then rally support to get the story out to the community, whether that's through a personal approach, so individuals talking to other individuals, um, or it could be an online presence, getting your message out, out that way. Um, there was a church in Derby Diocese who'd suffered a significant theft of <clears throat> metal and they, they decided that they were going to start a crowdfunding campaign and they put some banners up by the side of the road so people driving past could see it all the time um, and, um, and they ended up, uh, they had an aim of raising £20,000 and they raised over 35000 in in the end so that communication bit of that is actually key as well. Um, ask your congregation and supporters to post on their social media accounts to spread the message further. And you can also garner the, the support of the local press, radio and TV. Um, many years ago, more than I care to remember now, um, I used to be a scout leader and we were desperately short of leaders. Um, and we had a very long waiting list for children coming into all of the sections. So we contacted the local radio to make an appeal um, and, uh, and, and they said, yes, they would, uh, they would do something for us. And, and in the end, it turned into a half hour interview um, um, and which happened a week before our annual um, group camp. And we chatted about our group and what our plans were for the future, some of the things that we'd done in the past, what we were looking to do and what we needed for that, which was mostly volunteering. 
um, and then what that actually involves. So, what, so what we were asking, what did we actually really need people um, to do? Um, the radio presenter ended up coming along to the camp to do a live broadcast from it and we were so overwhelmed with the number of responses we we had we had far too many that our group could use for volunteers um and so um, um but we didn't just have them in our area we had them across the whole county of, of volunteers coming forward to um, to become leaders um so we had a story to tell and we got it out to a much wider audience than we would have otherwise um done um, don't be afraid to to, to let your light shine don't hold, hide it under that bushel um, communicate and get that message out to as many people as you possibly can back over to heather for the next bit just just to add to that can i just add to that because interestingly miranda's put in the chat um researching families commemorated in their windows produced links to trustees of two separate funding bodies which is really important seeing what those, those links from your parish and your church in particular uh, have you had any experience of that? Have you come across that before? Okay, or Heather? Is that to me, Liz? Yeah, yeah uh, I, I haven't, Liz, um, Liz, but Heather may well have done. Yeah. I, I guess it, it's it's about researching, isn't it? And it's looking what what are the assets that your church have got that other people will be interested in. Um, because there's there's likely to be something in a church that will interest somebody and and it's just about it's having those conversations isn't it um and making those connections which i think is why it's so important that our churches are open so that people can come in i think there's that real connection that people are interested in in coming and having a look yeah, uh, yeah. and, and that, that open churches is so important yes and definitely that that those windows are so are so vital we don't see that again thanks for that uh, at Crown as well in researching the windows, important links. Great, thank you. Thanks for those uh, helpful comments. Right, on to Heather, isn't it? Which are thank three. you, thank you, thanks, Kate. Um, so really, this is making the ask, make, making the applications, and really builds on uh, what what Kay has said in on the last couple of slides. Could I have the next slide, please, Liz? Thank you. Um, so really, there's there's four elements of this: is developing the case for the support, um, making successful applications, um, and we also look at asking individuals. And it, we'll go into a little bit of detail of online and digital giving. Um, as I've said on that slide, the case for support it's really about winning the hearts and the minds. It's really um, demonstrating what your church is about and what your project is about and in a nutshell why should funders fund yours project above everyone else's and as we know it's an incredibly competitive funding um, community at the moment and that's probably likely to increase with with COVID and the increasing pressures that the pandemic have created so it's really about identifying what the need is for the project what the solutions are um, and that dreadful word what will the outputs be that's that's um funders language for what difference will the project make and funders want to fund projects that are going to make a difference and on the whole make communities better places to live and improve people's lives so your case for support should be should be compelling and it is like I said about identifying needs and gaps and there's loads of places that you can go to identify what those needs you may find that through your own church's mission what are you doing at the moment in your church where might there be gaps how you, can you develop what you're doing um, are you working with existing partners where gaps might be apparent are you working with local schools local authority health provision third sector organizations funders really like to see that you're working in partnership with others so that will really strengthen your case if you're not already working with partners find out who those local partners are in your local communities community consultation is a really good way of finding out what the needs and the gaps are and that doesn't have to be complicated it's just about organizing meetings holding conversations asking questions getting insight into what is happening in your local community and statistics 
statistics are great at supporting our um, applications. And there's lots of statistics that you can um, search from. The, the Church of England uh, do Spanish spotlight reports. Um, and there's the Church Urban Fund that do a, a lookup tool. And basically with those, you just put in your parish postcode um, and it will provide loads of information um, about the trends and issues um, in your parish and really helpful to use to support your application. For everyone who's involved in churches, we know that they make a huge contribution to the community and often provide a safety net for the most vulnerable um, in our society. And that's illustrated really beautifully um, in the House for Good report that was published last year um, for the National Churches Trust. Um, I don't know whether you've, you may have already read it, but they estimated that the total economic and social value of churches that they contribute to their local community is about 12.4 billion a year, which works out about 300,000. So that's a huge contribution. Um, and it may be that you can use that report to help evidence and help support uh, your, your application. But if you do refer to that uh, report, make sure you bespoke it to your individual rather than the national church, because it's the local church the grant funders want to know about. The other thing to bear in mind is preserving old buildings whilst our listed buildings are really important. In the good old days, um, English Heritage would provide funding to provide a hole uh, to make good a hole in the roof. That's not the case anymore. They want to see how those buildings are going to be used. So funders now, it's about people and the difference the funds will make to the community um, and people. So just think about how you're phrasing and how you're framing your application. An example I can give you was a church I was involved in Manchester and um, the congregation needed to come to church with hot water bottles and in fact next to the hot, um, next to the um, hymn sheets they also had a stack of hot water bottles that they could give visitors as they came. Now they put in an application and they were successful um, at getting funding for replacing the heating but that wasn't because it enabled the congregation to worship in more comfort it meant that the church could be open up to a wider uh, variety of groups and that's why they were successful with the funding and um, a byproduct of that was that they had a more sustainable heating system that was cheaper and it actually brought in income because they could start charging higher rates uh, rental income because the church was a more comfortable building to be in. Um, include the track record of your church and as Kay has already alluded to, churches are not very good at singing from the top of the mountain about their successes. Churches do really wonderful things and often they go under the radar. Um, so when you're putting your application in, don't undersell what, what you're doing. And testimonials can be really helpful to support those applications, but obviously make sure um, they're anonymous testimonials, because what they do is they bring the human aspect and they tell a story and it demonstrates really clearly the difference that the churches make. It's about creating a compelling case because we all want to be part of a success story, don't we? We all want to, we, we want to give our hard earned money to a cause that's going to make a difference. So it's about creating that compelling case. Successful applications, make sure they're tailored to the particular grant um, or the donor that, that, you're, that you're looking for. They need to be well thought through proposals. And like I've already said, based on, on ev evidence and consultation and identifying uh, what, what that need is and making sure you find the funders, the fund, the type of project um, that, that you're trying to do. Build on the credibility of your church and this all needs to go um, in, into these grant applications. So again, um, your track record, good governance. Again, it's about funders invest in incredible organisations and you can demonstrate that through the governance that you've got in place. So your maintenance regimes, your safeguarding policies, your health and safety 
policies? How do you communicate? What are your lines of communication? Who makes the decisions? How are the decisions made? Where does the PCC fit into the structure? And remember, a lot of um, trusts won't understand church language. So make sure you put it in language that they can understand. And sometimes having a third person read through your application can be really helpful to make sure it's understandable to people who are outside the church environment. Um, and that language is so important. Um, the example I give is churches talk about mission, the secular world talk about outreach. It's exactly the same thing, but it's just different language. So just think about the language that, that you're doing. Make the applications easy to read not large chunks of text, break it up, use subheadings, make it easy, make sure your costs are realistic and your time scales are realistic and make sure you build in some contingency because as sure as eggs is eggs, there will be slippage and something will go wrong. Um, and trusts will take a view that they'll know whether you've over egged or under egged the costs and, and the time scales that, that you've put in. And think about what permissions need to be in place and whether you need match funding and where that match funding is going to come from. A couple of interesting um, examples, which you may well have come across. There was um, a church in, in Wiltshire that they found, tucked away in a cupboard, they found a Dutch old master, um, which they sold for a huge amount of money and managed to do a fantastic well, some people think it's a fantastic reordering, other people don't. I guess it depends where you're coming from. Um, but it's the church in Bradford and Avon, a really interesting one. Um, and there was another church, which I won't tell you which one it was, but they ended up in consistory court because they ended up selling a painting and they hadn't got the AC approval. So if you are selling assets, just be very, very careful and make sure you go through the appropriate authorities to do it. And really important part is monitoring and evaluation. Um, how are you going to mark? How are you going to know whether your project's been successful or not? Um, and we've got a whole webinar that, that looks at that in, in a lot more detail. Asking the individual, uh, Kay's talked a little bit about that. I think we need to recognise that COVID has been a very, very difficult time for a lot of people. A lot of people have lost their livelihoods. But for others, they've had a steady income with very little um, avenues to spend. So when we're looking at individual uh, donors, it's about knowing who our potential audience are um, and, and developing those relationships. And they're often a slow burn, but they can be fruitful. But it doesn't need to be money. It can be lots of other things that people um, can give. And I think when you're thinking about um, individual givers, think about your own drivers for giving. Why do you give? Because that's likely to be the same reasons that other people give as well. And people will have different interests. And use the social media, as Kate mentioned earlier on, use social media to build up your profile. Um, to build up that, um, so the community know what, what you're about and what you're trying to uh, achieve. Communication and thanks to all of that is, is absolutely critical. And finally, looking at online and digital giving, and there's huge opportunities here for um, attracting new audiences to, to give. It's a way for your congregation to give as well, but it's also a way for reaching out to enable other people who may want to give to your good cause. The starting point for this is obviously having an online platform. Um, and again, in book three of our funding little booklets, um, there's some more information on the online platforms that are available um, and the Church of England's parish um, resources website as well has lots of other information and so I would signpost you to have, have a look at those to find the right one that's right for you. Um, the little booklet mentions crowdfunding and that can be a really useful uh, funding tool. Usually it's for a specific project but they need to be very short, usually about two weeks and you really need to use your social media presence uh, to make 
what I would say is a, is a big splash to, to get it out there. Um, and that's where developing relationships on social media is really important because it's about getting your story out very quickly to lots of people. Um, QR codes um, can be really important, uh, can be really good. It's um, basically um, QR codes code the website address so it just makes it very easy for people with a smartphone to hold their smartphone against the QR code it takes them directly to that giving page um, to, to make that to make that donation and the beauty of QR codes is that you can reproduce them everywhere so you can put them on your newsletter you can put them on social media um, you can stick them up on on a poster on your notice board the important thing is to you need to check periodically that the qr code works and it's actually taking people to where you want them to be taken contactless devices again there's loads of different ones um, on the market and parish buying um, church of england's parish buying give you lots of information to find the right one for your church some of them don't need um, an internet connection um, and it's a really good way of getting donations for people who visit church i mean obviously you can use it as congregational giving but they're really good for leaving in church buildings for people to be able to use um, when when they visit churches and interestingly in 2018 there were more card transactions than there were cash transactions and i think that just gives you an indication of how important um contactless giving is um i think the thing to remember is use a variety of methods to enable people to give so that your giving becomes inclusive rather than exclusive and you shouldn't be doing one against um at the expense of another and if you're not doing social media and if you're not doing online giving don't don't beat yourself up about it there's there's lots of other ways that you can raise funds but there's also lots of information via the church of england and our via our webinars if online giving is something that you want to explore further and without further ado i'll pass you back to Kay. thank you You're muted, Kay. One of these days, it'll be smooth. <laughs> Sorry for that. So, yes, yeah, same, same thank you um, is the subject of the fourth um, uh, booklet. Um, and, and most of it really is actually common common sense. We all like to be thanked when we've done something. Um, and and this, is, this is no different. Um, and we, we've already mentioned the importance of considered and clear communication and saying thank you is just a part of that communication. Individuals who are thanked for donating are more likely to give again when asked. And a study in 2019 found that first time donors who received a personal thank you within 48 hours were four times more likely to give again. That's, that's pretty significant and it costs you a thank you, um, but that opens up further further giving um, in, in a way that um, it, it is quite astounding really. Um, I mean, four, four times is, is just incredible. So do thank your donors. Um, and, and when you are thanking them, keep it personal, um, not a pro forma. Um, tell them what a difference their donation has made. Um, and keep them updated with the progress. Sorry, Liz, could you move on to the next slide? Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> there we go yeah make it personal um keep them updated uh, with with the progress of the project um as well and consider how you might celebrate when um, when your project has come to fruition um as, as heather mentioned um earlier on um don't ask for a further donation straight away so when you're thanking somebody don't ask them for more um, but do know what you'll say if they ask you how else they might be able to help and it might not just be a financial contribution it could be volunteering it could be helping you to get the message out even further um, you know they may have a network of friends with the same interests that they can pass it on to so so be prepared to know what to say if somebody says is there anything more that I can do? 
Um, one of the things that it did occur to me here is, is how often does your church thank its regular donors? So your congregation, the ones who are giving week in, week out. Um, I have been in one church where I was thanked for my donations um, and, and only one church <laughs> where I was thanked for my donations. But I have when I've been on holiday and, and things and I've, I've, I've been to church there um, and I've gift aided it. Then those churches have often just sent a, a letter at the end of the year, um, which is quite um, um, you know, useful for, for doing your tax return and everything. Um, but, um, but they say, thank you. This is what you contributed this year. Thank you so much. It's enabled us to do this. Um, and, and it does make you want to uh, want, want to give again. Um, but I think perhaps our congregations at the moment need thanking more than ever for that continued commitment and support that they're giving to us. Ways that you can thank people. So um, direct communication, so phone calls, letters, emails, um, social media and through your website are, are also great ways. You might not want to thank individual donors that way, but certainly for, for donating, uh, for thanking um, corporate donators or, or trust and grant making bodies, um, then um, if they've given you support, then putting a thank you on your social media is, is, is good for that. Um, sending photos and videos of the progress. Um, there was a, a church that I was involved in uh, in Manchester um, that had had a fire and every so often there would be a, um, a, a video um, clip that showed the progress to date, um, you know, a fast moving one so you didn't have to sit and watch through three years of, of repairs, um, but, but actually it gave, it gave the progress and the updates. And that enables people to still feel engaged with it, even after they've given, um, again, ready for that next bit of, of, of maybe asking for something else. And be honest, you know, if you've suffered a setback, then, then be honest about it, but frame it carefully um, so that people, you don't want people to lose confidence in you, but you want, you want to be open and transparent so that they, they, they have that confidence that you can come through this and do the next, the next bit too. Um, asking for, for views and advice from people, um, um, it, it, it say it's not just necessarily the money, but that, that advice and guidance that people can give you is really valuable as well. And that helps people if you ask somebody what their opinion is, what you know, what what you do uh, uh, on something, then it, it enables them to become emotionally um, and or spiritually connected with what it is that you're doing. Um, and somebody that you um, um, you may be connecting with, um, somebody who's experienced in a particular aspect of your project who does really want to help you. Um, so that communication, that saying thank you are really, really key. Next slide, please, Liz. <clears throat> We've mentioned um, a couple of times um, now the fundraising um, hub and the resources on it. Um, so the hub was set up um, in May last year when we launched this, this project and then throughout the rest of the year we ran a series of webinars to help support you. So there was the first one was on, on top tips for fundraising, um, not just during Covid but beyond as, as well. The second one was digital fundraising um, for, for the church. The third one was keeping in touch with community congregation and supporters. So again, that's a lot about the communication side of it. Um, we did one specifically on successful grant applications and then one on measuring and reporting your, the success of your project because that those are, are, are really key elements of it. All of those um, webinars are available to watch back at any time on the fundraising hub. Um, on and on the next slide or the slide after that I've put but in the slides there is a there is a link to directly to the webinar page so that you can go straight there um, and to have a look um, and each of the webinars um, also had some fact sheets um, um, supplied with it to give you some quick reference um, and easy easy ways of, of picking out the information for each of those those subjects so if you've not had a look at the fundraising hub yet, go and have a look. It, it does have a wealth of information on it that, that is useful for you. Can I have the next slide, please, Liz? <clears throat> oh, look, and there it is. <laughs> so there's the, the website address for the fundraising. The, the webinar one is, is will take you directly to the page for the webinars. And then there's a telephone um, um, helpline that's available to you or an email, and you can email a query in um, as well. Um, 
in Truro Diocese, those queries will come back to me. Um, so, um, um, and you will have my details too. So, um, so do be free to be in touch. Um, but if you could, if it's a fundraising query, if you could do it through um, the fundraising um, helpline, either the email or the phone number, it just helps us to keep a track. And, and because fundraising isn't our core business and we need to keep a little bit of separation between the insurance and the fundraising. So, um, so yeah, please use the fundraising um, email address and phone number if you need to be in contact. Next slide, please, Liz. Um, so this was just a, um, some of the useful websites that we've mentioned through the webinar um, of, of, of places where you can go for um, for information and um, and and to to either for applying or for actually supporting you in in putting your your application um, together. Next slide, Liz. And this is just our contact details. So, um, so um, Liz and I um, talk quite frequently uh, about what's going on in the, in, in, in the diocese. Um, and if I get a query on the fundraising helpline, um, I, I will often be talking to Liz about what that query is so that we can make sure that we're giving you the best possible answer um, without you having to go to lots and lots of different places. Um, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, so Liz is, is, is there for you in the diocese um, um, and, and she is a brilliant source of, of useful information uh, on, on all things. I don't know if you want to say anything, Liz, about your role particularly. In... Yes, yeah, thank you. Well, firstly, thanks, thanks Kay and Heather. We'll, we'll have some questions in a second. Uh, but just to say, yeah, I'm here to help you with your your funding, your applications, particularly that one that Heather mentioned about having someone to proofread your applications. As somebody who's completely separate from your parish, I, I'm the person to send it to in a way, or you can send it to me. Um, and also church grants, just to say that as a diocese, we have a subscription to that. So um, if you want to access church grants, I'll send you again, I'll send you the link to that because there's a separate link. And um, if you need your password, your code, every parish has one of those. But let's, I mean, we've got five minutes left and we have got some, some great questions coming in. Um, Shall I deal with the one? I know there's been a few queries about how do you get a box. Um, yes. so, so the boxes are available for ecclesiastical customers um, only. Um, and um, a box was sent to the person who is the named correspondent on the policy. So in some cases that would have been the treasurer, in some cases it would have been a church warden, in some cases it would have been clergy, and in other cases it could have been a number of other, other people. But whoever looks after the insurance policy for your, um, for your parish is the person to whom the box was sent. If you if you don't can't can't find one you don't definitely don't have one then um, just drop me an email and I will arrange to get a, a copy sent out to you that's not a problem at all. Great. Um, just this is a quick one here uh, about the car transactions which could be possible without internet access. Uh, that's Eileen. Yeah, yes, they are. Uh, you can get uh, there's one which you can use which is used offline and then you take the device home and link it to your own internet which then will link those those donations and sort that out uh, we have got in the diocese we've had a, a web webinar on that whole subject so do have a look at the um the it's under parish resources parish support uh webinars page there and you'll find some webinars there to help you if not talk to christine she'll help you with those uh judith uh, from Cheviot, they've the high boundary wall collapsed into the garden with of Glebe House and Graves. The church is grade one listed and Glebe House grade two. We're finding it difficult to find grants. Any pointers, please? We've just completed a 360,000 project. Goodness me. Do you, do you want me to come in on that one? Go on then, Heather. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, Things like boundary walls are, are pesky difficult things to find funding for because it's how do you look at that in terms of a community engagement. However, to give you an example, um, I was involved again in a church in Manchester and uh, they had terrible problems with the neglected churchyard. 
um, and some of those are boundary walls and headstones and um, you know wild wild undergrowth and everything um, and they were able to get funding on the basis of using it as a training opportunity so they did dry stone walling as one of the outcomes um, improving the environment and they were able to access funding in that way. So it's often just think about what you wanted and just turn it on its head to think, how could we get the community involved in this? And actually, as a result of that project, um, it had a knock on effect for the church because people then set up a friends of group for the churchyard and then they became more actively involved in the actual church itself. Um, but it was on the basis of training that they managed to secure funding and improving the environment. Um, yeah. Mm, that's great. And the, the Church of England Church Care, that they do a lot of really good funding, don't they, for some of these kind of specific things like the organ or... It, 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 yeah, I mean, that's where the, the databases and the one you mentioned that, that Truro sign up to are really helpful because they do all the work for you in terms of searching, searching the, the right funds. Mm, yes, but that's a, that's a good one. Bells is the other one as well, isn't it? Church Care does that one. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And we had uh, one that was sent in in advance, didn't we, about, about getting funding for online um virtual streaming things like that that kind of equipment um heather would you like to, you to again i think it it depends what the what what are they wanting to stream for and if it's purely for worship i think the honest answer is that they will struggle um mm. to find funding for that but does it give them opportunities to think a little bit wider um, and could they look at it if if internet connection is particularly bad in their particular facility uh, area mm -hmm. could they then introduce an internet connection into their church to then open it up to create almost um, an internet cafe type environment where then people would come in into the church so again it's it's thinking a little bit wider yeah yes and, they, and that's one of the key things always thinking about how will our community benefit from anything we do in our church when you're thinking of having to apply for funding definitely isn't it mm. and I think, sorry, yeah. just, I, I think again it, it can bring real benefits because if you're bringing people into the church that makes the church more alive and potentially brings in more money more volunteers but it just gives the church building a completely different feel if if different people are using it yeah Great, thank you. And uh, question for Kay, is the fundraising in a box available in a PDF format? Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, yes, I, yes, I suspect it, 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 it could be um, if, if there was a, um, a, a need, um, but I'll, I'll have to check. I'll have to check. I'm I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, that'd be a good idea. Anyway, that's you know maybe that's something yeah. you can take back to head office. And yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Yeah. I'll certainly I'll pass that back and see if it's possible. Can I, just come in, can I just come in on that one? A, a lot of the resources that are in the fundraising in the box are on the hub. Um, obviously, you need to be online, but but there is it's it's replicated a lot of the electronic stuff that's online, so people would be able to download in a slightly different format. Great. Thanks, oh, thanks, Heather. That's great. Okay, I think we've covered. Have we covered that? Yes, I think we've covered all the questions coming in. So again, so just sorry, Liz. So I, I did pick up. There was one on QR codes. Oh, yes. Um, just about how to set up a QR code. Um, just to say on that one that um, some giving platforms. So if you're if you've already if you're already on a giving platform or you're thinking of going on a getting a giving platform, um, there maybe I'll be a mechanism there that they will do it for you. Um, the other alternative is if you just Google um, QR generator, it will take you to sites that will help you um, generate those. Um, and there was another one about uh, a church having poor signal um, and obviously the QR codes don't work in the building. I so said there's two options there. You can use QR codes on paper things that you can distribute. Um, you could put it on your other social media presence. Mm. 
um, or the alternative is to put the website under the QR code as well, which slightly defeats the object of the QR code, but, but that's a sort of a practical thing that people could do. Mm. Great. Um, Tra Tracy has, um, has, has asked a, a, a question. I, I think what you're actually asking for, Tracy, is some um, specific um, um, help with grant applications. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll, we'll take that one offline and I'll, I'll contact you um, I'll contact you separately um, on, on that one because I am conscious that we're, we've we gone five minutes, five minutes over. Great, yeah, thank you. That's great. Right, well, thank you. And for joining us today, thank you so much to Kay and to Heather for leading us through uh, this resource. It's a, it's a wonderful resource. I've got mine here and uh, it's going to be very useful to dip into because actually I have to say, even though we have got things online, it is, it is nice to have something. To... And it's all in one place, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, right, you can yeah. research the other bits and look more online, but you've got in front of you what's yeah. something that's useful to actually get you started and, and, and whatever. Um, yeah. There is um, when we send the slides round. There is a um, a link to a um, to a survey, um, uh, a feedback survey, mm -hmm. um, which is our our usual one. So it includes lots of questions about um, what other training and things you might find useful. But it has some specific questions around the fundraising in a box because we're trying to get some feedback on that to see um, you know how how useful people are finding it and, and if we need to make any any tweaks or anything so um, so please do fill in the feedback and let us know um, your thoughts that's great thank you very much thank you very much so thank you everybody for joining us today and uh, hopefully see you again for another webinar and all the best with your fundraising thank you bye okay. bye, -bye.